Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Brian Sung from Georgia Tech in the Integrated Men's Laboratory. Um, on behalf of um, DeathX Human Institute of Technology, the Europe Institute of Technology and Sorry Medical, we're going to be presenting about the detection of normal and paradoxical splitting in second heart sound using a wearable accelerator contact microphone. So today I want to first off start talking about the heart physiology. So the heart is a fluid mechanical system. It's basically a muscle and has two main phases. It has a relaxed phase, which is called diastole, and has a contraction phase called systole. And basically the main concept of the heart is that um, it basically push, pumps in and pumps up blood. So basically when it pumps in the blood into the heart, the tricuspid and the mitral valve actually opens up and allows the blood to come into the system. And then once the valvular is closed, it actually creates a uh, sound corresponding to the first heart sound. So, and then you all know for the heart sound, it's the, 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 the love of the heart sound is actually the first heart sound. And when the, during the systole, these two valves, the pulmonary and aortic valve actually open up. And then once these, allowing for the blood to be flowing out the aorta, and once these valves close, actually correspond to the second heart sound. So as you can see, like the valves are really important and necessary part of the actual heart. And these valves actually have valvular heart disease. And one main, most prominent valvular heart disease is called air stenosis. So air stenosis that you see right here is basically the calcification or the calcium buildup of the aorta, as I mentioned before. So this is an example of like a normal person, and this is a person uh, who has air stenosis. As you see, there's a lot more buildup or calcium buildup through these valves. So it's a lot harder to actually push blood through um, the actual heart. And the common symptoms are chest tightening and breathlessness, and severe symptoms are even heart failure. So in the Western Hemisphere in, in America, it affects 12.4% of people above the age of 65, while 3.4% of elders have severe air stenosis. And it's really important to know when someone has severe air stenosis, as uh, once they're uh, diagnosed with it, they typically have a lifespan to approximately three years. So it's extremely important to know when a um, person has air stenosis. So the common um, heart screening methods that are typically used today in the medical field is through an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram is basically an um, ultrasound image as you see right here, where the doctor is basically directly applying a probe towards their heart. And it involves a really intrusive process that takes a long time as you see right here. So even though it's really great for the doctors and other trained professionals, it's, there's a lot of cons to it. So the major cons is that it takes a relatively long time. It's costly. There's long wait times, especially in certain countries. And it's, so it's not as frequently used as doctors would want these patients to be using it. And it also requires active assistance and it's extremely bulky. So patients can't really do it themselves. They would need to go to a doctor or a trained professional. So that's so that's why there's a huge need for wearable devices for a, a longitudinal health monitoring or even through wearable devices. And there's a huge market need for wearable heart monitoring devices, such as a sensitive wearable microphone to capture the acoustic fingerprints of the heart, where I mentioned the S1, S2 sounds, and also passively capture the acoustics where the patient or anyone don't need to like do much except by placing this microphone on their chest. So this is the general uh, part of the medical device market. As you see right here in 2021, the market caps around $7 billion. And by 2030, it's actually projected to increase by more than triple. And there's a lot of um, medical devices out there, such as glucose monitoring devices, as PPG, as Steven mentioned, and also um, EKG with um, fitness um, bands. So this is an example of EKG data that you see right here, where the major peaks represent the S1. And this is the example of cyclocardiogram data, which is actually the heart vibrations. Um, so as you see right here, the, S, um, the actual major piece of EKG data matches really similar to the seismocardiogram data I see right here in just in general, and that means the heartbeat interval is like really similar. So the data corresponding from EKG data and seismocardiogram are really similar to one another. And the main thing about the seismocardiogram data um, from this is that it actually captures more of the S2 sound. You see right here, there's not really much information on EKG data, but with seismocardiogram, there's a lot more information as in the closures of the aortic and pulmonic valve. So I mentioned a lot about second heart sound, and actually, um, when the doctor plays a uh, listen to you, you typically probably hear the uh, dub. You don't really hear uh, two major peaks in the second heart sound. But, but the second heart sound actually consists of two major peaks. I see here the A2 and the P2. So A2 is, is known as the first, usually for normal physiological person, the A2 occurs first, as you see right here, and the P2 occurs afterwards. But in terms of paradoxal splitting or patients with severe air stenosis, 
there's instances where the P2 valve, where the P2 sound actually occurs first, and that's known because the P2 valve is typically smaller. And this is a key indicator, an underappreciated indicator for severe air stenosis. So there are a lot of uh, wearable devices for listening to the acoustics of your heart. As many of you know, probably the echo digital stethoscope, which captures the acoustics, and also the Thermo Fisher wearable stethoscope. But the main concept is that it's extremely large and bulky. And also another con with this is that it captures actual ambient um, sounds throughout in the environment. So let's say you're wearing this stethoscope or this wearable device out in the ER, if you're in a really neighbor, a noisy neighborhood, actually captures the noise and it interferes with the actual heart sound capture. So you would need a contact microphone. And our lab at Georgia Tech has created an accelerant contact microphone, also known as the ACM, which is an out of place magnet contact microphone with a wide band, a wide band of micro G capacitive microphone accelerometer. And this is the actual MEMS die, as you see right here. And this is the actual accelerant contact microphone. And because it's, we're capturing the micro G accelerometer, we can actually measure the body vibration. So any vibrations caused for the body, such as the heart sounds, and also your chest wall movement. So we would know when you're inspirating or when you're expirating. So with this accelerant contact microphone, we actually placed it on top of the molar region, as you see right here, and you see it's really small. And we placed the uh, accelerant contact microphone on to 14 subjects, 10 subjects that were healthy with varying BMI, and four subjects with known heart disease, such as air stenosis or air regurgitation. After we, uh, we collected the data, we then band passed filter to the data to the major heart frequency range, which was from 60 to 200 hertz. So as I said, we're getting streams of data, and we mainly want to uh, capture specifically the S2 window. So you want to specifically see where the HMP2 peaks occur. So for healthy subjects, we calculate the normalized average channel, channel energy, and we also use the typical systolic and diastolic time of the typical person to determine which signals, which peak for S1 and S2. We're able to determine um, the S2 peaks for majority of the healthy individuals. But for healthy, unhealthy individuals, um, they have a lot of murmurs that might interfere with the actual S1 and S2 sound. So you see right here, the, uh, the murmurs, there's a lot more murmurs than uh, unhealthy patients, but you can still see distinct S2 signals. So we just did visual inspection for that. So we're mainly trying to find when the A2 and P2 peaks occur. And the best way to do it, and this is an example of like S2 sound right here. And the best way to do it is by looking at the instantaneous frequency and instantaneous amplitude. I see the instantaneous frequency is a good indicator to determine when the actual A2, P2 peaks occur. And with that, we want to look at time frequency representation. And there's a bunch of out there, as you probably know. So the most popular one is continuous wavelength transform, which is essentially a short-term Fourier transform. But as you see, it has really low resolution, and you mainly just see only one major blob, so like one major peak. So we opted for a more higher resolution method called Wilkner-Ville distribution, as you see right here. So it's a little bit more high definition, a little bit more resolution, but it's still a lot of cross so you can't really know where the A2, P2 peaks occur. So then we utilize Smooth suitable distribution as you see right here. So this is, as you see right here, two distinct clear peaks, and you can easily tell which one's A2 and P2. So, so let's give a bit of information. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is the actual frequency, so then you can see where the change frequency is. And the actual um, intensity or the color map is the actual intensity. Needed. So as you see over here, the more yellow it is, the more higher is the amplitude. So with that, we can actually determine where the A2 and P2 peaks occur, essentially. So this is an example of the data we usually collect. So top graph is filter data, just this fantastic filter. This is the distribution that I mentioned before. As you see right here, there's two main blobs. Uh, you can faintly see it because the P2 sounds typically a lot um, softer than the A2 sound. But by calculating the instantaneous frequency and the instantaneous amplitude, you can actually, uh, from a product of that, create a uh, great intensity curve. So then, therefore, we can determine where the A2 and P2 peaks actually occur. So, as I mentioned before, we collected data from 14 subjects, 10 subjects with varying BMI. As you see right here, from 21 BMI up to 40, around 40 BMI, which has, uh, which shows that even though that this, we're just measuring the vibrations of the heart on patients that have a lot more fatty tissue, let's say, on the colonic region, we're still able to capture the S2 time splits. Same right here. And the main key part of that is that we're able, actually able to capture the paradoxical splitting, as you see right here, from patients with air stenosis or relating heart disease, such as air regurgitation. As you see right here, we got from 10 to up to 23 counts of paradoxical splitting within a minute of data. So, this is an example from a patient with high BMI, so around 38 BMI, so typically a lot more fat content, again, 
And we're still able to capture the HMP2 sounds right here, where this patient had a time split of around 45.82 uh, milliseconds between HMP2. And this is an example of paradoxical splitting that you see right here. So again, you can kind of see right here from filter data that P2 again crisp first, then the A2 crisp afterwards. And then this is the distribution as you see right here. And this is the great intensity curve where the P2 crisp first. And this is an example. I want to first talk about um, murmurs. So as you know, murmurs, um, a lot of people with valvular heart disease have murmurs. And it might interfere with the S2 sound, but uh, this is an example where we're actually able to capture the S2 sound. So this is like kind of an artifact from the murmur you can see right here. But we're still able to capture, um, due to the instantaneous frequency of it, um, able to capture the actual um, P2 and A2. And with instantaneous amplitude and frequency, we can actually uh, show that we're getting paradoxical split uh, with that patient. So in conclusion, we've utilized the Exxon contact microphone to um, accurately capture the S2 sounds and S2 time splits. We've captured and identified paradoxical and normal splitting in patients with eric stenosis and even patients with high BMI. Uh, potentially, we can use, um, use the ACM later on as a wearable or at-home device to detect S2 paradoxical splitting, especially patients with eric stenosis. And further investigations include utilizing multiple ACMs to determine, again, um, automatically determine where the S1 and S2 sound is. So I'd like to give a special thanks to Spethex for funding this research and also Georgia Research Alliance. Um, thank you. Right.